Christmas story is not really a story, but more of an unofficial tradition that my family has. You see, my mom loves Christmas. It's her favorite time of year. So much so is that she actually had rules about Christmas time. Rule number one, you can't watch any movies unless it's a Christmas movie after Thanksgiving. Rule number two, you can't listen to any music unless it's Christmas music after Thanksgiving. Rule number three, things like decorating the Christmas tree or doing cookies had to be done as a family. And rule number four, you cannot get out of forced family fun, which was a time that we would all get together and play games. It was required. There was no getting out of it. And I know it sounds kind of ridiculous, like, wow, really, she had rules, but these rules actually really helped to bring us together as a family. It made the year special. It made that time special. And I don't know, it all just kind of taught us to hold that time of the year with just a love and, and an appreciation. So even when things were kind of not going right in our family, we would all put our differences aside to enjoy that season because it was set apart to be a time that was special. And the one thing that always happened, no matter what, never planned it, was never like, oh my goodness, we need to do this because we do it every year, it just happened, was our yearly Christmas performances. Yes, that's right. I had my debut way before in character, way before setting foot on any stage. My debut was in my mother's kitchen with a mixing spoon while making cookies. See, in our family, Performing is something that just happens. And you know who always really led the charge on this one? It wasn't me. No, no, no. That would be my sister, Chelsea, my older sister. Compared to my sister, believe it or not, I am the shy, quiet one. Because my sister, who was always the star of these performances, was the lead singer, the head choreographer, the director, the videographer. It was Chelsea. She had it all under control. I have pictures and videos of year after year, whether it was in the kitchen while making cookies, we'd start dancing and using our mixing spoons as microphones, or some years it was a full on production where she would rope us all in and get us into costume and make choreography and film it. There's evidence of these things, yes. And just in case you're wondering, this didn't just happen when we were children. No, no, there are definitely videos of me doing these performances well into my 20s. We never really grew out of it. Actually, the only reason why we ever stopped doing it was my siblings started having their own kids and their own Christmases and their own Christmas traditions. But don't worry. Because even though I may not be performing in my mother's living room, you better believe that my nephews every year send me a video of their Christmas performance. Tap dancing in the kitchen or doing flips off the couch to some Christmas song or singing on the top of their lungs with their arms stretched out like they are just center stage on Broadway. You best believe that those Christmas performances are still happening. And in case you're wondering, yes, they are Chelsea's kids. But I guess performing just runs in the family. And some traditions just never die. And so that is what means to me to have a Christmas experience. That's our Christmas story. My family is a family of performers and it doesn't matter where we are or what we're doing. The world is a stage, especially at Christmas time. Hey, we're the Washburns, and we're here to share with you our special Christmas memory that we hope that after you hear it, you'll be so mesmerized by the memory of our festivities <laughs> that uh, it's just gonna be a blast. So here's, here's the way it works. Uh, when we were up in Michigan, these guys were super young, and um, we, had a, we had an issue, and that was that our church did a five and a 10 p.m. service that I was involved in. And so our night was really busy on Christmas Eve, and yet, with these guys being young, we wanted to make it memorable for them. So what we would do is we would do the five o'clock service, and then we would do something really cool after that. All right, so where we would go is this one restaurant, 
that it, it just so happened to be the only restaurant open at that time on that day, the China Buffet. <laughs> yes. Where these two right here would eat <laughs> remotely Chinese food. And us two, yeah, yeah. And us two would eat <clears throat> uh, chicken, rats on a stick. <laughs> they were not rats. And cheese pizza. That's why I had the potato. I think it was squirrel. Was it squirrel? <laughs> no. It was chicken. Was it? anyway. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. So we would eat those, and it was fun because as the year went on, years went on, uh, more of our friends would actually join us at the at the at the restaurant. And we'd have this really cool family time with, with a, group of guys, a group of people, and it was really fun. Oddly yeah. enough, people like that kind of idea. It was a great idea. Don't I know. do life alone. That's right. So then after that, we would go home, and, and we wanted, again, we wanted to have give them this really cool experience about Christmas Eve. So home looked like we would go into, uh, the tree would already be on, and the littles would come into the house, and all excited because they get to open their first Christmas present, which was what, Ethan? Pajamas. <laughs> which we would always wear on Christmas. Did you like the pajamas? Is that a fun idea? Yes. But yes, the gift was very good. Much better than the socks, at least. <laughs> right. <laughs> so then after that, we would go upstairs. It was a two-story house. And like when I was growing up, my sister and I would, we also had a two-story house. We would lay in the landing uh, and listen for Santa Claus. And so that's where we would sleep. So the boys got doing that. And underneath their Christmas tree with Christmas lights on, so they're all snuggled in their uh, sleeping bags. And then Dad would come upstairs and yeah, we would read the book the night before Christmas. In fact, this book is the actual book we would read, and we actually still do read it just for fun. But that's the book that that Bobby's dad read to her and her sister. And so we continued that special memory, and uh, it was really sweet to just be able to be together and read this. And the boys were, you know, still in that wonder stage, you know, a little less. In the wonder stage now, right? Yeah. yeah, I'd say so. But the wonder stage is great when they're small. And then we just, Bobby and I would go downstairs, boys would go to bed. We'd go downstairs and just relax. To the light of the Christmas tree and some soft music, and it was so peaceful until... Until it was time for the 10 o'clock service and I had to scoot back out. And uh, But that's that's our memory, and yes. we love it. That's, it's this great memory that we have, and we're grateful that we had a chance yes. to share it with you, because Michigan is different. Especially on Christmas Eve, right? Yes, where, get this, there might have been snow. <laughs> it's, <laughs> this right here is, <laughs> it could be an exaggeration. I'm not sure, we've been down here a little long. <laughs> well, we're not expecting snow on Christmas Eve here in Florida, but uh, that's our Michigan memory and we're grateful we had a chance to share it with you. Have a great Christmas. Good morning, everybody. And tell us someone right now, and I'm going to tell you for the first time in 2020, Merry Christmas. Tell them that. Tell someone. I don't know what I'm saying. You distract me, babe. So it's good to see everybody this morning. How's everybody doing? You have a great week. Do you have a great Christmas story? I would encourage you throughout this season to share your stories. I'm so thankful to see those stories of uh, just celebrating the Christmas season. And you know, babe, you know, we have so many good stories to tell, don't we? What's one of your favorite Christmas stories real quickly before we get into the Word of God? In Luke chapter 1 this morning, go there and we're ready to rock. Um, one of my favorite pictures of Christmas is um, this one that they're going to throw up. I don't know about everybody's Christmas is exhausting, right? We're all tired, but my sister snapped this of me a few years ago, laying down after all of the <laughs> presents have been opened and all the craziness, and that's about what I feel about Christmas, exhausted Amen. and dead. Um, it's especially, I think, for a pastor's family, Christmas time is exhausting, and so um, that was a funny memory to see my, my, me just laid out that's so. most likely around christmas eve or christmas day after we do the four services we used to yes, do I think that was here at the church yeah, yeah so that's really cool so i'm a big kid at christmas i love christmas sarah's got the house decorated i'm I, i'm about to get on the outside i'm a little behind the curve but uh I, i'm excited i just love to ride around and do christmas lights our, our neighbor, uh, Coach Mack and Rosalie, man, they, they blow it up in the ranch. So you have a chance to drive in on the Jones Loop side. It's awesome. So how many is a big kid at Christmas? Any kids in the – yeah, all right. So we got a few kids. But you know what? There are some kids that don't like Christmas. Do you know that? Isn't that, isn't that sad? Everybody go, oh. Yeah. So, yeah, 
what do you call a kid who does not celebrate Christmas? Right? They're a rebel without a clause. It's just... <laughs> anyway, let's go to the Word of God. Let's talk about the best story we can uh, talk about today. Luke chapter 1. We're going to talk about this impossible situation where this basically teenage girl who is engaged to be married all of a sudden has a visitation by an angel and says something to the effect of, hey, by the way, you're going to get pregnant without a man's help. And how many know that's a pretty improbable story? So let's go to the amazing Christmas story, Luke chapter 1, right from the get-go. Babe, if you'll read that for us, then we're going to talk about it today. All right, so I'm reading out of the NIV version. If you want to open up your Bibles, it says, In the sixth month... Verse 26. Yeah, sorry. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary? asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. Say amen to that. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And so today, let's pray together. Father, let your word become alive in us. Lord, let us not just go through this rote religious experience where we kind of go, okay, that's, that's kind of good academic stuff. But Lord, let it become alive in us. May we leave different than how we came. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. In the NIV, verse 37 says, no word from God will ever fail. I want to show you this in the amplified version. I love this. It breaks it out into a little more details, babe. And it says, for with God... Nothing is ever, I'm sorry, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Can we read that together? Everybody say it together as a proclamation. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. So I'm so grateful for Sarah being with me today to, to kind of help me bring this point to you guys and our Christmas and our family. But I want to tell you what, when we're praying about this, if you're watching online today, how many know that 2020 has been an extraordinarily different year? Yeah. Amen. How many have had some challenges in this year of COVID-19, right? Man, we, there's still kind of, you know, we don't know what's going on. I don't want to get anybody riled up, but I was reading some articles that are saying, hey, man, the vaccine's coming awesome, but we really still need to shut the country down, to so to speak, or, you know, everybody mask up, and we're thankful for the people that are wearing masks and the people that don't choose to wear masks, but they're, you know, we're, we're not in a lot of uncertainty right now, of, even until the spring or summer, before the vaccine could take full effect. So how many know there's still a lot of unknowns out there? How many in April or March of this year expected us to still be dealing with this in December? I don't think any of us did. In spite of where you come down in the politics, because we know, baby, it all gets messy. But here's what I know. There's a lot of challenges before us this Christmas. There's a lot of challenges in life. But here's the promise. I want to show it to you one more time. For with God, nothing... What is included in nothing? Everything. Nothing is or ever shall be impossible. What are you facing today that's impossible? What relational struggle? What addiction? What habit? What discipline? What financial situation? What failure from the past? I got a few of those, babe. What, what is in our lives that we just can't seem to get around? The song we sang this morning, right? Do it again. That first line, baby, what does it say in that song that's so cool? Walking around these <laughs> walls. I was like, wait a minute, what is it? Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. Man, Powerful. 
powerful, God, where are you? What are you doing? What's going on here? Lord, help me understand this. Well, here's your thing today. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. Here's your first point. If you want to take notes, write this down. Make it, write it. Go get the tattoo. (laughs) God wants to give you today a Christmas miracle. God wants to give you a Christmas miracle. Now you say, Steve, man, wait a minute. What is that? What is a miracle? Babe, what, how would you describe a miracle? What is a miracle? I describe it as something supernatural that yeah. I can't do on my own. Something that is impossible in man's power that is what? Possible with God. So how can God do miracles? Well, if I'm looking at the Word of God, go with me here because I know already if you're like me, I'm the skeptical guy going, wait a minute, but why do I pray and why doesn't da 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 Here's what you need to know. For with God, nothing is or ever shall be impossible. But sometimes God's answer and our miracle may not look exactly like we think it's going to look, right? But what you need to know today is God wants you to live a life full of peace, joy and contentment, all the things that Christmas stands for, a life of giving, a life of loving, a a life of knowing what it means to be with God. But today, you need to tell yourself and help somebody out right now and turn to them right now and say, are you ready for a miracle? I love that song. Are you ready for a miracle? What is done for me? Come on, let's go. Um, God wants to give you a Christmas miracle. And before Sarah comes and kind of gives us the how-tos of this, Can I give you four quick things? Write them down. Put them in your heart. Again, go get a sub-tattoo to your tattoo. Here you go. It is this. I don't know why I'm on the tattoo thing lately. Uh, You don't have any. I don't have any. I know. I'm not cool that way. Um, Number one, God is with us. How many of you know God is with us? Mary, as we read that uh, passage, God is with us. Number two, God, this is my love, and this is one Sarah's been teaching me. God favors us. I have five awesome children who are absolutely perfect. That's funny that they Because they have a perfect mom. Because they have a perfect mom. <laughs> exactly. All right, how many parents in the house? Raise your hand real quick. Which child is your favorite if you have more than one? Oh, I, I got something going right here, yeah, with, with kids. How many know any good parent, their response should be, and it actually is, that they're all loved equally? They're distinct, but we all love them equally. How many know when God looks at us, he looks at us individually, but he loves us equally? Now, God, I think, is kind of like parents, because some days I don't like certain kids as much as I like the others. Anybody with me right there? They, you know, I think God probably gets that way with us, and that's why, you know, go ahead and say no, it, babe. that's okay. Oh, oh, yeah. We're on a time schedule, so okay. I'll be quiet. <laughs> God favors us. Turn to somebody and say, you're God's favorite. Number three, guys, God is with us. God favors us. God will not fail us. I want you to get this stuff because it's just the precursor. God will not fail us, and God is with us. He favors us, and he will not fail us. Why are those things true? Only because of number four. Say this right now. God loves us. I want you to turn to somebody right now and go, Jesus loves you, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? So God wants to give you a Christmas miracle, babe. He wants to give you a miracle, me a miracle. And what we need to know today is that we, how do we get this miracle? God, I want to believe that. I have these doubts. How does this happen? How do you get your breakthrough? How do you get an answer to that relational crisis, to that failure in your life that's nagging you and dragging behind you, to that unknown with your job that's going forward? I talked to a gentleman right after our first service about he's just been out of a job. He was looking for a new job, and because he was working remotely, he moved, and then the company kind of thought he might be looking, and so they got rid of him, but he didn't have a job. So now he's kind of stuck. There's a lot of uncertainty. He needs a miracle. And I'm I'm saying I'll be praying for you. But how we get that miracle, number one, guys, is we must learn. You must learn, babe. I must learn what it means to be with God. Is God with us? Yes. 
But how many know you can be with someone but not be with someone, right? And how many know that can happen? What we understand is Emmanuel, Jesus, came to this planet in fleshly form. It's a beautiful Christmas story. Then he lived a life that we are to pattern in love and giving. And then he went, baby, to the cross, died for us, rose again so that we can have the beauty of Christmas, of giving and of love. But we have to learn what it means to be with God. In any relationship, it is a giving of oneself by both people, Right? If you're in love and married, how many know you can be, again, in a room with someone and not be with them, really with them? I remember a, a, a memory that is not good for me is my senior year in high school, went to the homecoming dance right after the football game, and I took a girl that I really liked. She was beautiful. She was sweet. She, she, I didn't deserve to go to homecoming with her because when I took her to the homecoming dance, there was another girl there that I liked more. Somebody turn and go, your pastor's a scumbag. And neither of those girls are me, so. Neither of those girls are you. No, no. And, and so here's the, here's the crazy thing. I was with this one girl there, but I wasn't with her. And I, and I really, at that point, I got to tell you, I didn't say this in the first service, but she, <laughs> I forget what she said to me, but she had such tact and cooth. She said something to me in parting that night that was so well said and so cut my legs off in terms of basically telling me I'm a scumbag, but doing it in a most respectful way, right, in, in how I acted. But here's what we know, guys. Oftentimes, we say we're with God, and we want the blessings of God, but we're thinking more about the other girl or the world than we are about God himself. The Bible says and often refers to people that are not committed to him as adulterers or cheaters. And the first thing I'm going to tell you, if you want your miracle, you can't cheat on God. You got to learn what it means to be with him, right, babe? Just like in a marriage. Absolutely. And the next thing we have to do is we have to learn to wait on God. Yeah. And uh, this, is, this is one that is challenging, right? Because who likes to wait? <laughs> you guys are like crickets, crickets. <laughs> I know we don't like to wait, especially we've learned that over the last year, um, that COVID, we've been, I think it's like 37 weeks we've been doing um, the prayer time. We started that right after all of this happened and things kind of shut down. So we started this online prayer time on Facebook and Instagram. So I think it's like 37 weeks we've been doing it. So that's, you know, that's a while. But setting up this context of Mary's story, it had been about 400 years from the time that Malachi who was a prophet, um, he had heard and was speaking for God, and um, it had been about 400 years since that time, and so now the angel Gabriel steps into this point in history, um, and so can you imagine 400 years? We've not quite been a year, and we are, you know, scraping, itching, can't wait to get back to normal, normal, right? So waiting is an issue. It's a big deal, and I think it's especially probably more of an issue now because we have microwaves and we have Amazon Prime mm. and we have all the things at our fingertips, drive throughs I, Do you know, I, I love picking up my groceries now. I don't even have to go in the store. I order them online, and then I just drive up there and they bring them to me. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, we have this idea of not waiting, so learning to wait on God. And one of the things that I've just been thinking about, even as Steve spoke last week about um, thanks, Thanksgiving and learning to be thankful, everything in God's Word takes training. Yes. Do you know, I see uh, Bart sitting out here. He's a pilot, and so I looked this up last night. I think it's like 1,500 hours that you have to be in order to be a pilot. Is that right? Of flying That's time? a lot of training just to get your, so 1,500 hours just to get your, your pilot's license, And then you right? have to go through ongoing training after that. Correct. Yeah. I was thinking about those who um, do um, Ironman. Anybody 
crazy like that and do Ironman? I know we have them in our church. I am not one of them. I'm a good cheerleader for an Ironman. I watched my friend Jennifer Knox do an Ironman. It was amazing. I have to tell you, watching that dedication and that training that they do in order to do an Ironman is unbelievable, right? So what I'm saying to you is to do something fantastic and unreal, like flying a plane, which I think is pretty awesome, or doing an Ironman, it takes tons of training. And yet we have this life, we have this, this gift from God that he has said, I have come after 400 years, I am finally bringing your awaited Messiah. And so he comes to Mary, um, and, and so it's just this amazing thing, but we have this amazing story and gift from God to actually become sons and daughters of God, as Pastor James had said, yeah. and yet we don't train for it. Mm. So there's a gift that's given to us, but if we don't train to learn how to live and, and walk in the gift, then we will never actually really grasp all that God has for us. And so this waiting portion is important. And so I think sometimes, maybe you had a, a parent that made you wait just as a punishment. Anybody? Like they just waited to say yes or no because they, wanted, they just wanted to kind of punish you or they were, whatever their reasoning is. Um, but that is not God's intention when right. he makes us wait. He has good reason for waiting. And so do you know that we can waste our wait? Mm. I think a lot of us probably have done that in this period of waiting, is that we have just wasted our time. We've, we've, a lot, I've heard the COVID-15, and I'm not getting on anybody, okay? I'm not getting on you. I'm just saying this is something we got to train. People gain and wait. We've sitting in front of Netflix. So we're binging. We're, we're feeding the emotional frustrations of what's happening that we are waiting and we're not getting what we want. And God says, I have something better for you. Mm. If you train your weight, if you train to wait on me, I have something beyond anything that you could ever imagine. Because in the waiting, we learn something powerful mm. about who God is. So waiting is not passive. I think often we think we're just standing there. And we can do that, but we will waste the wait. So it's not passive. It's an act of service. Where do you think of, when you hear the word wait on, what do you think of? Yes, yeah, speak louder. Restaurant. Restaurant, right? Maybe you haven't been to one in a while, but um, that, yeah, that's what I think of too, is that somebody's waiting on my table, right? They're serving me. So waiting on God is an act of service. Waiting is an act of silence sometimes. If you read back right before Mary's um, encounter with the angel Gabriel. Zacharias had an encounter with the angel Gabriel and he didn't believe him. And right. so the angel shut him up. Yep. <laughs> so sometimes in our waiting, we need to be quiet. There are lots of scriptures about that. In, in Psalm 62, it says that we will wait silently before the Lord. Waiting is an active trust, a dependence upon and obedience to the Lord. Waiting is an act of your will. Anybody ever try, tried to train your will? It's a lot of dang work right? It's a lot of work. Is that a word I'm allowed to say? Dang, yeah, I guess they are good. Okay. <laughs> Waiting is an active focus. We'll bleep it out on the edit. Okay, so, thank so. you. <laughs> Waiting is an active focus, and so Psalm 130 says, or uh, uh, Isaiah 26 says that my eyes are fixed on you. When my heart is fixed on you, when my eyes are fixed on you, then I will be in perfect peace. Waiting on God is desiring him more than desiring his action and waiting on God is waiting for him to act right so all of those things take training and then we see it in verse 38 it says Mary's response behold I am the servant of the Lord may it be done to me according to your word so she'd had the word from Gabriel and now she has to wait just like any pregnant woman has to do right we we realize oh we take the pregnancy oh, I'm pregnant and now it takes nine months to have that baby. I think I see a, a beautiful pregnant mama back there. So there's this waiting that happens. And I love the, the correlation between waiting on God and the pregnancy because we are all pregnant with uh, potential that God puts yes. in us, but we have to wait on him. And then we also must learn to walk with God. Amen. And this is, this is something I love as well because walking with God requires action as well. And so you can go, well, waiting doesn't require action. I hope you've seen that, yes, there is active waiting. But then walking, actually walking by faith, you are obeying him. You are walking in his ways. Obedience is actually what makes the impossible possible. Because in Hebrews eleven six it says, But without faith it is impossible to walk with God and please him. 
For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek him. So our faith in God doesn't make God act, right? God is, right. God is going to act and he's going to work out his ways, but we get to walk with him and be a part of that reward and blessing when we walk obediently with him. And so in that obedience makes the impossible possible. Amen. So training that walk with the Lord. Training to walk with people who worship, not with people who whine. Booyah. Those, <laughs> if you choose to walk with people who whine, you will not see your Christmas miracle. And Christmas miracle can happen any time of the year, right? We're not talking about a specific time like this is the only time. Right. No, the Christmas miracle was that Jesus came at this time. This was the appointed time that... that Everybody had been waiting for. And so this was his time to come. But the Christmas miracle is that we've been brought to, from death to life. But we won't get it. We won't receive it. We won't grasp the fullness of it if we don't learn to wait on God and learn to walk with God obediently. Amen. Good stuff, babe. Everybody say, be with, be with. Wait, on, wait on, walk with, walk with. worship. All right, so worship ties it all together, and we're in a worship service, and Sarah so eloquently, I hope you don't mind me saying that, babe, has said that we need to wait on God, and we need to walk with God. Now, God wants to give you a Christmas miracle, but their principle applies in the waiting and the walking, and it really is a, a life of sanctification when you think of it, because our whole life in Christ is a miracle. Turn to somebody and go, by grace I am saved. Not through works, not through anything I'm doing, lest we should boast and we should have control of our destiny and our happiness and our peace and our contentment and our joy. And that's not it. And so what waiting and walking tells us, in the meantime, in expectation of our miracle, there's things I need to do and there's things I need not to do. Any good dad, any good mom, any good parent, any good boss is going to tell you, what you need to do, but then they're going to also tell you what you don't need to do. And I'm going to tell you the coolest thing about waiting and it being an act of worship. It's because often in the waiting, what we think we need for that miracle, we find a greater miracle in the waiting that takes us to a different level in life. Anybody track it with me right there? Is that we find, God, I need this Lord, you know, you guys heard me joke about this, and it, but it's true in the early stages of my marriage and when I thought I was more holy than I actually was, God, you need to do something with my wife. As much as I love her, she needs you, Lord, Lord. You need to change her, you know. So our Christmas miracle is that December 17th, we're married 26 years. Yeah! <laughs> you stole my... Oh, sorry. <laughs> She stole my thunder. But it is a miracle that we are still married, right? But what you learn in the waiting and even the asking and the expectation is maybe the miracle is God is going to change me when I think he should be changing X, whatever X may be, job, situation, uh, whatever. You know, even in the fact that I remember when my friend... Stephen Snyder, who worked with us up in Alabama, who was a basically almost quadriplegic. He had used one of his hands, got in a terrible car accident when he was young. But he went for a prayer to be healed and went to this healing. But he talked about the fact that God, the miracle he received was understanding how content and happy he was in his wheelchair. Now, can God heal people that are paralyzed? Absolutely. We believe in that. But are there times when God chooses not to? And I believe sometimes what we believe is a bad outcome is actually a better outcome. But the Bible tells us this, guys. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decision and his ways. Now, that's hard, babe. That's hard. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? Have you ever gave God advice? How many like to give God advice? I do, right? You know, God, let me tell you what you need to do for Sarah. <laughs> let me tell you how you need to tell her to treat me. How she needs to kiss me more and love me more, right? And tell me what a wonderful man I am. <laughs> Can you see God just sitting up there going, oh, 
Extra grace required for this one, Holy Spirit. Let's work. But he goes on, and who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? Listen, for everything that comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory, all glory to him forever. Guys, the last point today is we must worship only God. Listen, there's two things when we come to Jesus, and we need a miracle. One of my Christmas miracles is all my kids, 9 to 22, are alive and well today. And I'm thankful. That's a miracle. There, I've had critical times. If you're a parent, you know you're going to go through times where there's going to be accidents and illnesses and you know Tyler has a, a, a chronic illness that you know you just walk through that and Tyler has epilepsy and there's a story about an epilep- epileptic child and the father brought the boy to Jesus and Jesus asked the boy uh, the father boy's father how long has he been like this and he said from childhood he answered he says it's often thrown him to fire or water to kill him he said now watch this but if you can do anything Jesus take pity on us and help us You notice he didn't say, Jesus, I want you to heal this guy now. He said, watch this. If you can do anything, Jesus, to help us, help us navigate this, give us wisdom. He didn't demand a thing. He just said, Jesus, I need your help. And what you need, if you need a miracle today, this should be your prayer. God, I know you can do anything. I know you can do everything. But if you can do anything for my situation, I'm going to give this to you. Now, this guy is so much like me. Jesus said, if you can, like, you tell me if I can. Jesus said, everything is possible for one who believes. Now, watch this. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I love that passage of Scripture. Watch this as it deals with worship, okay? When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he's dead. He was so at peace. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. How many know that's a beautiful thing, right? But there's something more miraculous in that story than just this beautiful healing of this kid. It's the fact that a man came with belief and what? Unbelief. Faith and what? Doubt. How many have doubts about your God sometimes? Come on, be honest with me. Right? About your walk. At some point in your history, now Sarah, rarely does it happen where me, I'm like the skeptic. I need apologetics. I need a, I need a dive in. God, what, how does this all work? But here's the crazy, cool thing. Jesus didn't go, well, you got unbelief. Come back when you're fully all in, all faith, and I'll, I might heal your son. He said, he healed him. And here's the beautiful thing. Worship is understanding that God wants all of you, both your faith and your what? Hear me today. One thing I know about my wife and the reason that she is still with me is because when she said those vows, I will love him for better or for worse, she has seen the worst of me. But she hasn't seen near the worst of me that God has seen because he knows every detail of the worst side of Steve. And the fact that in my worst sin, in my worst times of doubt, in my worst times of failure as a son, that Jesus still loves me. But worship is coming to him with your faith and your doubt. And saying, Jesus, I follow you. I give you my life. And if there's anything you can do in my situations, God, not my will, but your will be done. To God be the glory for the things he has done, he is doing, and he will do. And in your life, And I'm going to tell you, that realization of God and his glory is the greatest Christmas miracle anybody in this place can get. It's it. That's it. But without faith, it is impossible to walk with God and please Him. For whoever comes near to God must necessarily believe that God exists and that He rewards those who earnestly and diligently seek Him. 
Remember, you bring your faith, but you also bring your doubts. He wants all of you, baby, all of you. So let's pray together at this time. Sarah, I want you to just pray for people that need, as we all do, in different circumstances, that Christmas miracle, that impossible that can only come from God at this time. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come humbly before you. We love you. God, we thank you for your word that does not return void. We thank you for your promises that are true no matter what our eyes see. We thank you that 2 Corinthians says that we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. So, Lord, we're declaring the promises of truth over our lives. Father, I thank you that even in our doubt, even in our fears, even in our disappointments, even in our despair, that you are more than enough. And God, it's always, always about relationship, not about an act. And so, God, I pray that you'd get our hearts there. You said you'd give us the desires of our hearts, but what happens when we wait on you, when we walk with you, and when we learn to worship you in spite of things that are going on, God, that you change our hearts. You change our desires. God, that obedience with you, walking with you daily, relationship with you changes everything. And so, Lord, even as I look out at faces today, knowing my own story, knowing things that have happened in my own family, knowing about people and disappointments and heartaches. God, I thank you that you don't diminish the pain of walking in this life. You have felt every pain, every fear, every heartache, every grief. So Lord, we don't diminish what is happening in people's lives. We don't diminish the grief that happens as we walk out this earthly time. But God, as Hebrews 11 shows us that even when we don't have our miracle on earth the way we expect it, that we're waiting for a country that's far better. We're waiting for something that we cannot even imagine. Our eyes are fixed on the spiritual realm of what's happening. So do that in our hearts today, Lord. Work in us in a miracle way that we can't explain. Because the truth is, is that being brought from death to life, salvation of our souls from a time that we would no doubt be in hell, and you sent your son Jesus into the messiest of stables, into the messiest of situations, in the most unexplainable way, you're going to do that for us. And that miracle can never be talked. So, Lord, we wait on you, and we do ask. I just keep hearing for us as we were preparing that we don't stop asking. Don't stop asking. If you are despairing right now, if you're like, I've just given up. Elizabeth and Zacharias and the story in Luke 1 right before Mary's inner encounter with Gabriel, they had given up, really. They were old. There's no way they could have a baby but God. And so if you've been waiting, keep asking. I feel the Holy Spirit saying, keep asking. Don't give up. Don't despair. Wait on him. Walk with him and worship him because he loves you and he sees you. We praise you and we thank you for who you are, Lord. There is no one, no one, no one like you. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you turn to someone right now and say, are you ready for a miracle? I want to say, I want to say thank you this morning. While wow, Davey, come up, Davey. I want to say thank you to God for giving me my earthly miracle December 17th, 26 years ago. My wife said yes to me. Yes. Now. Yeah. And we have been the most perfect couple on the planet. It is, it is truly a miracle to watch what God has done through us. And I want to say this before Davey comes. The greatest miracle, the greatest relationship, though, was when I started my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that Jesus is first in my wife's life. Jesus is first in my life. And if you put Jesus first, he will make this 
and all of this so much better. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is the day. Don't put it off. It is the greatest miracle you will ever experience in your life. If you want to know more about that, you can ask any of our team, and we would love to take you through how that happened. God bless you. Love you guys. David, you're up. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Give him a round of applause.